Hello friends, it is another day, another sports card video. We've got some content gold to react to. You take the card and put it in the sleeve. You take the card and put it in the sleeve. You take the card and put it in the sleeve. You take the card and put it in the sleeve. You take the card and put it in the sleeve. The It's Jeff Wilson Show, always coming in with some hot takes and actually some good conversation today. It came out today, I believe, and we're going to kind of talk through that. There's things that I that I liked about this, some good points, and a couple of things that I was not crazy about. We're going to dive into it now. All right, friends, if you are new here, please hit that subscribe button down below. We're coming out with pretty much daily sports card collectibles, commentary style, newsies type stuff, type videos, and you don't want to miss one. Also, connect with me on IG. G at Sports Card Dad. All right, Jeff starts the video out right away on the wrong foot. I will play that clip now. Frank, play the clip. Now play it. I made some great deals and some pretty bad ones as well. And I've taken everything I've learned and I've updated my sports card investing strategy. I'm about to give it to you right now for the first time, as well as talk through it with an expert from my sports card investor team, so we can both hear what they think. Right there, he said Teapot, a member of his team, an expert member of his team, a sports card investor expert from his team, will be joining him to talk cards and talk about the money-making side. He, he makes mention this video, this is not a PC collector stuff, this is the making money stuff. All right, so he brings Teapot on, he calls him an expert right there in the intro. Now, he's probably gonna say to me, hey man, you're nitpicking here a little bit, but when you throw out the term expert, and it didn't sound like he was joking, maybe I took it wrong, there's a little bit of a yeah when you hear that, it's like, Ugh. I firmly do not believe that there is such thing as sports card investing experts. I would say the closest thing that there is, one of my hobby friends, Chris, baseball card collector, investor, dealer, he buys out collections, he sells it off in pieces, he keeps certain things for his collection as needed, but he's operating more on the low to mid end, just really knows cards, he's really dug in on a lot of different sets, he knows what he's looking for, and so really if we're talking about the making money side, that low to mid end that you can buy in bulk, piece it off and sell it, that really seems to be the most tried and true way to make money in cards. Jeff has made waves over the last few years because he is a high-end buyer. He is a whale that's come into this space over the last few years. He has spent a lot of money on cards, and actually, he's probably made quite a bit of money on flips, some of these high-end flips, but today he actually talks about some of the things he wants to adjust, kind of a new sports card investing strategy as he moves forward, some things he's learned over the last few years, and I, it was welcome conversation. Again, Again, when you watch the Sports Card Investor channel, you do get kind of that high production, but it's pre-planned. It's very by-the-book broadcasting type stuff. The It's Jeff Wilson show is just straight up talk and conversation, whether, whether it be with Kelly or with Teapot. So I really like these episodes. I'll put a link to Jeff's video as well so you can check it out. All right, so some of the cliff notes, some of the comments that he made is that a lot of the focus that he has currently, football and some soccer, he really looks at current players mainly as short-term plays, speculation, flipping. So in other words, for really mainly anybody that's playing right now, there might be a you know, few exceptions. LeBron James is still playing. Steph Curry is still playing, et cetera. But for most, the vast majority of current players, he is looking at those as short-term plays, speculation, flipping, not buying, a, you know, he mentions Josh Allen, not necessarily buying Josh Allen to hold for 12 years. These are his words. Teapot states, all rookies coming out are overpriced. And I think that he is right when we're talking about the last few years. He says the sweet spot is players who really kind of emerge in year three, year four. They don't necessarily have a lot of hype coming out, so their rookie cards are not as expensive. And then they kind of emerge Emerge as they as they get older and mature, maybe like a Giannis. Giannis is kind of that example of when that happened, when you could get Prism rookie cards of his for five bucks or whatever, and now it's you know it's gone up and it's gone crazy. Seven hundred and fifty dollars. Really, to me, in my opinion, the biggest problem in, in trying to invest in sports cards for modern, ultra modern cards is really if we look at the last few years, the Zion, the Jaw draft class, you got the Joe Burrows, etc., the Trevor Lawrences. These cards came out during the slush money years. These are this is pandemic money years and also just low interest rate environment years, you know, to where there was money flowing. Yes, exactly. But it's, it's like we always talk about, I mean, that pandemic boom, it's thrown everything out of whack. So when you're looking at numbers and pricing for a lot of these newer players, really let's look over the last four years. 
it's just a wild roller coaster ride. It's that Mount Everest climb and fall. <laughs> And so I really think that for draft classes, probably like this coming draft class and moving forward, you'll probably get a better idea of kind of what pricing looks like. But we still have Hobby Box. There's a lot of new product that's coming out. It's still overpriced. You see it come out and to start, what was it, Prison Basketball that just came out? I think a Hobby Box was, you know, six or $700. When was the last time? If we go back a few years, I mean, they were always kind of $1,000 plus. This was the year where people were like, oh, wow, it's actually come down to six or $700. If you go back five years, they were $150, $200. You know, so we're trying to find that balance. There's some balance in between there to where new product is going to eventually settle. That's really the biggest problem when you're looking at these new players is just there's so much slush money flying around. The new product's still very expensive. Now, on the other side of that coin, slush money flying around, it also means that guys like LeBron, Steph Curry, they're also still very expensive because there was a lot of money flowing into not just the new exciting rookies, but also the GOATs and the retired players, the Hall of Famers. Oh, would you look at that? Yeah, well. Would you look at that? Yeah, there's a few more blemishes on the car. The oh car, my gosh, just car, look at the it. The car is not perfect. Just look at it. <laughs> That's why when we look at the falling prices charts, you see kind of that, you know, it was steady for a long time, then the huge climb, and then it comes back down. If you do a five-year look back on that data, you're still probably looking okay on a lot of those cards. Now, Jeff also mentions that he's got some concerns about current players, all-time greats like LeBron James, and he brings up an example, and I want to play the clip because I think it's really important. I'm going to go ahead and play it. Let's go ahead and play it. And it's a great transition to talking about what type of cards I want to hold for the long term. Because one mistake that I made that I, you know, in, in the process of trying to go back and correct and wish I had done things differently was I didn't buy cards that were rare enough. I didn't buy cards that were sought after enough. I didn't buy cards that necessarily iconically are going to hold the test of time. Yeah. Like instead of buying I thought it was really cool that I bought all of LeBron's Topps Chrome refractors from all of the different years. And I think that that, that is cool. Um, and some of them are very low population I, in PSA 10s. I bought them all in PSA 10s. Some are very low population, like population 10. Yeah. But the people out there who are really caring about chasing that, you know, 2000 and which one's the pop 10? I think it's the 2007 lebron james tops chrome refractor that's a pop 10 card in psa 10 but the people who really care about chasing that that's not the one they're going to chase they're going to go chase the gold yeah you know they're going to go chase the gold yeah. number to 50 they're going to go chase some, you know maybe some of the other parallels they're not going to necessarily chase the refractor so yeah the refractor is lower pop but did that does that mean much to the high-end collector who's trying to get the best they can they're going to want the lowest numbered parallel they can get or they're going to want the gold because that's so iconic across all those years so yeah the answer is i've thought about selling some of those and i would be taking a loss on a lot of those cards but i thought about selling them and just and and upgrading the rookie stuff i like having the complete rookie rainbow i won't sell any of the stuff from 2003 yeah, yeah. but the other years i thought about like yeah maybe i sell my refractors from 04 through 09 and then I, I, you know, really try to go after the golds from each year or something of that nature. And then, you know, it, it even even if they're in a slightly lower grade, but go after the golds and or, or just pull up money until I can get the golds and high grades every year. All right. So he's looking at the purchases of the Topps Chrome Refractor LeBron James from you know, 2007, 2008, 2009 in PSA 10 condition. And maybe he should move out of those cards because he doesn't feel that the, the people chasing these cards, and I wanna focus in on that, because they're gonna want the golds, is what he's saying. They're gonna want more rare cards. I do understand that conceptually, that high-end buyers, they want the best of the best, the big money. If the Jeff Bezos comes in, he wants the one of one, or he wants the, the gold prism out of 10, or whatever it is. However, if you are long-term holding on this stuff, we don't know what those people, those collectors, those investors are going to want. If you're long-term holding 10, 15, 20 years down the road on these cards, you have a current group right now that's pushing a lot of the, you know, the PMGs and the gold prisms. And of course, there's rarity and scarcity around those cards. But look at the collectible space. There's, there's examples all over where you have a numbered card to 10 that is selling for less money than a numbered card out of 50 based on this narrative that someone threw out there or whatever. The collectible space is full of narratives and there's that everyone's driving kind of these, you know, this gold prism and the PMG stuff, which those are great cards. I don't want to take away from it. 
But I, if I'm long-term holding, I wouldn't necessarily care about what the current folks that are saying about what they would collect now. They might be out of this game. In 10, 15, 20 years, they might be long gone. It's more about what are, what's the, you know, the 20-year-old right now who gets back into this hobby, let's say goes out, comes back in the same way we did. When they're 40, 45, what are they going to be chasing? And we don't know what that is. I think the biggest issue is, is Jeff, these are purchases that Jeff made over the last 18 months or so. If he had bought these in 2017 or 18, would he have the same feeling about those Topps Chrome Refractor PSA 10s? Meaning if he had got, gotten them at a fraction of the price that he probably bought them for, he's probably up on those carts because they're still, they're still valuable. And so again, it just boils down to price point. I think that the remorse that we all have, myself included, I've got cards too. I'm going to talk about one next week uh, where I lost money on it and there was a purpose why I did it, but it's kind of on the back of the video that he's making now. It talks, it kind of speaks exactly to what he is talking about. I think the remorse is just more about price point. It's getting in on the 2021, maybe front half of 2022 pricing before things really started to to move downward and that's not just a Jeff thing that's that's everybody that bought cards uh, you know in 2021 front half of 2022 partly and I've got some of those as well he does name off a list of players that he is focused around which I thought was interesting and not surprising players on the list at all you could interchange some of these as well but so I took this as his long-term hold players and maybe he'll still prospect on some folks but it, like he said short-term flips but the four players he's mainly locked in on are Michael Jordan, Jackie Robinson, Tiger Woods, and Bill Russell. Those are the four that he is most interested in. The second tier is mainly all the vintage baseball greats. It's Ty Cobb, it's Babe Ruth, it's Mantle. You know, he just basically names off Ken Griffey Jr. is one that's a newer player in that list, but it's basically, he also threw in that he bought the best Drew Brees rookie card, which actually I disagree with him on the card that he bought. Now, he bought a great card, but I'm just talking about as a Breeze PC collector guy, he's going at it from a price point perspective of this is the best card based on sales price. Told you guys, I bought my, my biggest purchase here over the last couple of weeks. I'm gonna share it next week along with the story behind it. It is a Drew Brees rookie card, spoiler alert. It is not the card that he bought. And so I do disagree with him on it being his best rookie card, maybe most valuable rookie card, but he got the contender auto. It's a PSA 10 with a 10 auto grade. Awesome card. But his main point is, is that if I'm going to buy kind of that lesser tier QB, so you've got, you know, Tom Brady and a Peyton Manning, Drew Brees would be kind of next up, you know, as one of those guys, he's going to get the best of the best. If it's going to be like a Drew Brees, for example. And so he got this card. I'm going to share a card next week though. It's interesting because it's unique even to the one that he bought and at a much lower price but still the most expensive card I've ever bought. I'm excited to show you guys. So this is a good overall video by Jeff. And again, showing some humility and kind of changing up the strategy and this and that. But again, I go back to, I don't believe that there are any sports card investing experts period. It's a collectible space. It's highly volatile, unpredictable, so many different factors. It's different from traditional investments. If you look at, you know, stock gurus or financial advisors that are helping to manage money, money managers, they're able to look at all sorts of different things, whether it be company earnings, company history, stock price history, they can look at a million different things. They can't necessarily forecast and predict the future the same way that we can't do for sports card prices, but they have so much more information at their disposal, whereas in cards and collectibles, so much is driven by narrative and trends or whatever. It's completely unpredictable. So I think the biggest thing, and we would all agree on it, is collecting cards, whether you're trying to make money, buying, selling, flipping, or you're holding long-term, expecting for hopefully some gains on those cards, is just having fun and also just enjoying the things that you've got. I mean, look, there's a lot of, if you want to operate on the high end, there's a ton of high-end cards with, with future potential. And I think it's just more about which of those high-end cards do you really want to own? Which ones really speak to you? And also on the mid-end and low-end, it's really the same story. You know, yes, we kind of hope that some of this stuff goes up in value or might be PC stuff you don't really care at all about if it goes up in value. The main point, the number one thing is, is that we're all having fun doing it. That's the biggest takeaway is the hobby is supposed to be a fun place. All right, guys, stay healthy, stay awesome, and I will talk to you again later.